inspired by your work and advocacy, and we look forward to hearing from you very soon. We also want to welcome all of our friends on Facebook. I understand there's quite a few people out there participating in this forum uh, through that platform. On the eve of the Feast of, of Our Lady of Guadalupe, we particularly focus on her title as Santa Maria del Camino, Holy Mary of the Journey. And we reflect on how she continues to accompany the most vulnerable among us through the work and through the voice of our speakers today, but of each one of you and the work that you do to accompany migrants. And so, as we begin our day, I want to especially welcome and thank our colleagues from America Media. We thank you for this opportunity to partner with you on this conversation and to host it. This is truly, I would say, the most urgent sign of our times. And so, these conversations uh, are necessary, and I hope that they will lead to many other conversations and ways of partnering, ways of working together. To guide our conversation, I want to invite and welcome Father Matt Malone, the President of America Media and Editor-in-Chief of America Magazine. Don't you w wait in anticipation for that to come out? So, it's an award-winning publication that leads to ongoing conversation about the issues of our time and about our Catholic social teaching in action. So Father Malone, uh, we are honored to have you here. We, uh, we recognize that your work and your ideas have been featured in all kinds of publications from the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Washington Post. We are truly privileged to have you here with us and I invite you to begin our conversation. Join me in welcoming you. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. Good morning. Good morning. It is truly a pleasure uh, to be with you this morning and to share in this conversation about uh, what Dr. Chavez rightly calls a a vitally important sign of our time, uh, if not the most important sign of our time. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Chavez for that welcome, and, uh, and uh, His Excellency, and our sister and father for being here with us um, to join in this conversation. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, read something to you from the founding editorial of American Magazine, which was published on April 17, 1909. Um, and the editors wrote, We are more responsible than our non-Catholic fellow citizens for the welfare of thousands of immigrants of our own religion who come to us weekly and for their amalgamation into the national life. That was 1909. And that was written by a group of men, none of whom were born in North America and who were aware of the fact that the uh, first non-indigenous language spoken in this country was Spanish, and that it was spoken by Catholics and not Protestants. This issue has been of uh, editorial concern to America since that day, from day one. Um, and just over a year ago, American media announced that with the support of a private Catholic family foundation, we were launching a new initiative called The Church in America. And in launching this initiative, we are seeking to become a resource for coverage of issues related to Latino and Hispanic Americans. In pursuing this goal, America Media has been hosting a number of events and discussions and uh, keynotes and symposia throughout the United States addressing the issues that affect uh, this community, and in particular, how the uh, social structures, both within the church and without, um, affect the social and political and ecclesial lives of this community. This program is in uh, conjunction with our ongoing, our ongoing coverage, both in print and digital media, as well as audio and video, and in our uh, newsletter, <coughs> Love Me Beer, 
which aggregates our Latino coverage on a weekly basis and is edited by our senior editor, J.D. Long Garcia, who is here with us today, um, and heads up this editorial initiative. Coordinating with a number of key partners and universities and dioceses and movements, America focuses on where the church in the United States is headed in the next century, while emphasizing where the church has already been for so long. In leading the conversation, it is our duty as Catholics, and I would also add as Americans, to include all voices of the church, to serve the vulnerable, to emphasize those voices that are often not heard or forgotten by the mainstream media, whether in institutional planning or community organizing or in the media scape. And the Church in America initiative serves as a starting point to deepen this conversation. And it is really a pleasure for me to, uh, to be here among you and to visit this amazing community and this amazing facility. Six years ago when I became the editor of America and I read that we were the national Catholic magazine, I thought it's about time we put the national in National Catholic magazine and, uh, uh, and get out of New York. <laughs> I'm also glad that it's a little warmer than New York <laughs> at the moment. Um, we are honored by the presence here today of the Archbishop of San Antonio, the Most Reverend Gustavo Garcia Silla, who is, uh, was named Archbishop of San Antonio by Pope Benedict XVI in 2010. He was installed as Archbishop on November 23, 2010, at St. Mark the Evangelist Church in San Antonio. He made his profession as a member of the Missionaries of the Holy Spirit and was ordained a priest in 1984. From 1999 to 2003, he served as Major Superior of the Missionaries of the Holy Spirit, administering an area that, at the time, included the United States and Canada. And he was elected the Orders Provincial in 2003. On a national level, Archbishop Gustavo currently serves on a number of committees of the United States Cath Conference of Catholic Bishops, Cultural Diversity Committee on Hispanic Affairs, African American Affairs, Committee on Hispanics and the Liturgy, Committee on Migration, and served as Chair of Region 7 of the USCCB. He also served on the Committee on Consecrated Life. And he can add to his resume that he is one of the most watched videos of 2018, uh, an interview that he conducted with uh, one of our editors, Father Jeremy Zippel, uh, about this very topic. And so, I am delighted to introduce him <coughs> and to hear his keynote address. Well, I would like to, to start uh, this uh, sharing, thanking the Lord and thanking all of you for giving the given the time to reflect on our brothers and sisters, immigrants and refugees. The topic that I was asked to reflect on is fixing the immigration system. My God. <laughs> our leaders in the administration have, have not been able to do it in decades. We will try. We'll try. Let's try. Always the dialogue brings something new, a new piece that should be contemplated in this uh, dialogue uh, regarding our immigrants. I would like to put a little in context this. Last night, the auxiliary bishop from the, uh, here, the Archdiocese, uh, and I <clears throat> uh, went to celebrate Mass to our migrants and refugees, children, and young mothers with <coughs> children. It was a very, very beautiful moment of communion and to be with them as they continue in this Camino, Camino, Camino. For some of us that Camino is towards Christmas, as for, for them is to find a home. And we are with them. Also, in the, in the context of this uh, reflection, uh, the Pope said few things today 
Well, he always says few yeah. things. <laughs> so that is not news. <laughs> but precisely about what we are talking here today. He says, everyone should, according to his or her specific gifts, fight to project the fundamental rights of individuals. Each person is therefore called to contribute with courage and determination in the specificity of their role to the respect of the fundamental rights of every person, especially the rights of those who are invisible, or many who are hungry and thirsty, who are naked, sick, or stranger, or imprisoned, who live on the margins of society or are discarded. This need for justice and solidarity has special significance for us Christians because the gospel itself invites us to turn our gaze to the least of our brothers and sisters, to be moved to compassion and to concretely commit ourselves to alleviate their suffering. the eve of the celebration of, of La Morenita. Seeing the experience yesterday with children and how they are in some way numb with our expression. <laughs> You're talking about <coughs> teenagers. experience of San Juan Diego. Se inclinó ante la Virgen. Oyó su pensamiento y su palabra, sumamente recreadora, muy ennoblecedora, como que atrae y procura amor. Y le dijo, oye, hijo mío, el más desamparado, digno Juan, ¿A dónde vas? Our lady expresses herself with such cariño and recognizing in that man, a noble man, a man that holds the dignity of a child of God. Well, I am delighted that the Mexican American College is hosting this gathering in association with American Magazine. Mac has played a vital role in the Archdiocese Ministry of Evangelization and Formation for nearly 50 years. Addressing issues of immigration is close to my heart as an immigrant myself. <clears throat> as a bishop of a local church that extends to the west all the way to the border. And as a fellow citizen committed to defending the dignity and rights of all our fellow human beings. Further, the border, bishops of Texas, New Mexico, and our counterparts in Mexico meet twice a year to discuss immigration problems that impact our pastoral ministry, Tex-Mex. <laughs> We live in a very difficult time in our country. Some elected officials are using migrants and refugees as scapegoats for the nation's social problems. In doing so, they dehumanize our sisters and brothers, subjecting them to harsh, even cruel, and draconian public policies. We can look no farther than to the border, less than 200 miles from here, for examples of this, from family detention, separation, and prosecution, to the militarization of border communities. Our conference of bishops here in Texas 
also are facing something that just came to my attention. And it is really sad. This morning, we, the bishops, submitted the attached comments to support the work that USCCB and CCUSA have done to oppose the proposal public change rule charge, public charge rule, under which non citizens who are in the country legally could still be denied a visa or a green card if they earn less than a comfortable middle class salary, suffer from a medical condition, or have financial liabilities, among many other disqualifiers. So, tremendous challenges. It's just one after another way that the people who made decisions for us and for people, vulnerable migrants, find ways to discard, to build an elite <clears throat> of comfort and unjust way to deal in with the issues of our time. Less people involved. These rhetoric and these policies are creating an atmosphere of hate which divide us as nation and sadly as church. It is a time when people of goodwill, those of us here, must stand up for our brothers and sisters who are fleeing, fleeing violence and threats of death in their home countries. We must continue to defend their dignity and right to seek a better life for themselves and their families. How do we do this? Pope Francis gives us a powerful example. He's constantly going to the margins to welcome the stranger. His first trip as Pope, we know, was to the small island of Lampedusa in the Mediterranean. He could have chosen anywhere in the world for this first trip, but instead, chose to go to visit the most vulnerable refugees. He spoke of the globalization of indifference, about the plight of migrants and refugees globally, saying they are not pawns on the chessboard of humanity. At the Mass for Migrants last July, Pope Francis said, before the challenges of contemporary movements of migration, the only reasonable response is one of Solidarity and mercy. Like the Holy Father, we also must stand in solidarity with migrants and refugees by accompanying them, sharing the journey with them. We share this journey when we defend them in the public square and ensure that their due process rights are protected. Due process. We do this by creating programs through many organizations, like Catholic Charities, Catholic Re Relief Services, with other Catholic agencies in their home countries to help them to stay there to live in dignity and safety. Caritas has done a tremendous work on the other side of the border, of borders. And we do this through the advancements of comprehensive immigration reform, which could help undocumented immigrants and their families come out of the shadows and become visible contributors to the building up of our nation. In answering to fixing the immigration system, number one, Well, the overall, the overall first. A Catholic immigration plan. What does a Catholic immigration wish list look like? 
On what basis will Catholics advance it? Our response is based on Catholic social teaching, which in turn is based on scriptures, the Bible. Allow me to begin with the U.S. and Mexican bishops pastoral statement, strangers no longer, together on the journey of hope, released in 2003, which highlights principles from immigration reform based on Catholic social teaching. From this statement and other Catholic sources, including the teachings of Pope Francis, a robust immigration agenda emerges which will reform this system in a fair and humane way. Number one, a path to citizenship for the undocumented in the United States. Of course, this should be the central tenet of our immigration reform, as it will bring a large hidden population out of the shadows. As the U.S. bishops have pointed out, a path to citizenship would keep families together, enable immigrants to fully integrate into society, and be consistent with national security. This path to citizenship should be fair and achievable within a reasonable time period. As this broad-based efforts may take time, Congress must move expeditiously to prove legal status to DACA and temporary protected status recipients. <laughs> While it is obviously the most important aspect of any solution, a path to citizenship will also be the most controversial. But it is critical to re reforming the system and it will ensure that everyone on the right side of the law before the rules change. A majority of the US public supports such a solution, recognizing that the undocumented immigrants can pay their debt and become fully contributing members of our society. Number two. Reform of the legal immigration system. Contrary to the current federal administration's view, the Catholic approach to improving the legal immigration system will be to increase its efficiencies and as well as an additional legal avenues for low skilled workers to migrate legally not through a dangerous trek in the desert. The first goal will be the elimination of wait times for family reunification permanent visas, green cards, which in some cases can take decades. Removing the cap on green cards for immediate family members of legal permanent residents and placing them in the US <coughs> citizen category which has no cap and about a six months waiting time would be a good start. It would also open up slots for other family categories, decreasing wait times overall. Many of you involved in this, you know how time plays a very important role and in a favor or destroying damage in the human person, or building up the families, or destroying families, as I saw yesterday, how many families are separated. They were babies, babies, one month old. And if they had been walking for months, that shows clearly how our system is broken and how unjust, unfair, and evil it is. On the labor side, there are only 5,000 green cars in the current system for low-skilled workers. Despite the demand for immigrant workers in the service, construction, 
agriculture industries. These numbers more, must be increased. And as a stranger no longer advocates a visa program that protects the rights of immigrant workers and gives them a chance to earn permanent resident, residency, would help fill that void. Presently, the needs of the low-skilled labor market generally are being met by undocumented workers who are sadly vulnerable to abuse and exploitation. We just heard two days ago, and was in our papers here in, in San Antonio, about a woman, well, not woman, a minor, minor, who every day, because our broken system, is abused sexually 15 times, a minor, because of human trafficking. The current administration policies eliminate family categories and replace part of the employment-based system with a point system skewed towards wealthy and highly skilled immigrants. With the nation's workforce aging, baby boomers retiring, and population replacement level at an all-time low, the merit-based approach will leave the U.S. economy with severe workers shortages in the decades ahead. The U.S. economy, the largest in the world, requires workers of all skill levels, not just the well-educated. A merit system could complement the current system but should not replace it. Thirdly, strengthen the U.S. asylum system. We have seen recent attempts to deny as asylum seekers the opportunity to, to present their claims in the United States. We're talking about international law and the rights of every human person to live someplace in the planet. That is very sad and is inhumane. A recent proclamation by the president, which has since been struck down by a US court, will force asylum seekers to wait in line at ports of entry, which will take months, months or years. <clears throat> Another possible proposal will keep them in Mexico until their hearings, which in some cases could take not only a year, but years. The delaying justice is denying it. <coughs> Instead of reducing protection for asylum seekers, the Catholic position will ensure that all asylum seekers are granted due process protections consistent with international law. This will require more resources for immigration courts, which currently have large backlogs, along with providing legal representation for asylum seekers, especially children. This would make the court system more efficient and ensure that asylum seekers are given their day in court. The use of expedited removal should be extremely limited, except for those who legitimately threatened national security. Fourth, immigration enforcement. Catholic teaching recognizes the right of sovereign nations to control their border and enforce the law. From the perspective of Catholic teaching, the question is how such enforcement is conducted. The Catholic Church is not against the enforcement of the law properly formed as long as it is applied fairly and humanly. Human rights and dignity should be paramount in the enforcement of immigration law, a principle that is often discarded by current immigration policies and their implementation. Due process protections 
the elimination of unnecessary detention, and access to legal counsel are essential elements of a just system. The administration's principles now focus on increasing resources for deportation of immigrants with a demand for 10,000 more enforcement agents, 5,000 additional border patrol agents, and additional immigration judges to conduct deportation hearings at the border. Combined with the 2017 Presidential Executive Order, which makes all undocumented immigrants a priority for enf enforcement, this represents a formula for the mass deportation of immigrants who have lived in the United States for years and even decades and have equity in their communities. Exactly the same people who would benefit from a path to citizenship. In fact, we have seen a sharp increase in the arrests of non-criminal immigrants in the past two years. The Catholic position is, first, to bring those who are not a threat out of the shadows to register with the government, ensure they are not a threat, and place them on a path to citizenship. But making them known to the government, law enforcement could then focus on a true criminal threats. Additionally, the police of mandatory detain the, sorry, the policy of mandatory detention must be addressed. What kind of a nation are we if we are locking up women and children who are not a threat? Here in the Archdiocese are two of the biggest family detention centers in Carn City and Delhi. Instead of keeping families in these centers, we should insist on alternatives to detention, in which groups such as Catholic Charities and other <coughs> initiatives can provide case management to families and help them to prepare for the asylum hearings. This is more humane and, yes, much less costly and goes more along with the gospel. Fifth, lastly, border security and the need to address root causes of flight. The president's focus on the construction of several billion dollar wall across the 2000 mile southern border, again, has focused attention on border security, despite the fact that border apprehensions are at, at an all time low. Also a study from the Center for Migration Studies found that from 2010 and 2000 through 2014, visa overstays exceeded the number of border apprehensions. Thus, as many have argued, a border wall is both unnecessary and very expensive and doesn't indicate in any way that a human person is considered in either side of the border. A wall also will not stop migrants from trying to enter the country to find a better life, as the factors driving them to leave their home countries remain stronger than any barriers erected to stop them. As such, the church's response to a border wall simply put always, simply put, always has been to address the push factors driving people to take dangerous journeys to reach the United States. By our addressing and endemic poverty and violence in descending countries, people could and will remain at home to support their families in peace <coughs> and security. The church's answer to a border wall is sustainable economic development in developing countries. Since this is a long-term solution, which would require global cooperation and commitment, it is not considered politically realistic by many in Washington. Nevertheless, it is possible. 
As the Mexican economy has improved, for example, the number of workers from Mexico crossing the border, according to a CMS study, has decreased by 11% over the past, uh, past five years. So as a conclusion, moving forward, moving forward. The task for Catholic advocates is to make their voices heard in a way that creates political leverage for an agreement that provides a third path to citizenship for the undocumented and reforms all the aspects of our immigration system in a humane manner. This, of course, will not be easy, but it will, must remain focused on, on this vision. The Catholic community should not shirk from the principles included in a Strangers No Longer, which outline just and humane reforms to the system, regardless of the political climate. However, as always, we must leave our faith in solidarity with the migrant and refugee, who is only trying to survive and possesses gifts to share with us. We must also speak out against all forms of xenophobia and discrimination, both in the public square and with our neighbors. The U.S. Bishop's recent statement on racism strongly opposes xenophobic attitudes and harsh rhetoric concerning migrants. Racism is not only a sin, it is evil. Let us be illuminated with this text from the Nikan Mopoa, that encounter of San Juan Diego and Our Lady of Guadalupe. Remember, the, the Blessed Mother told him, Oye, hijo mío, el más desamparado, digno Juan, ¿a dónde vas? Y él respondió, Dueña y reina mía, tengo que llegar a tu casa de México, Tlatelolco, a seguir las cosas divinas que nos dan nuestros sacerdotes, que son imágenes de nuestro Señor. Entonces ella le platicó y le descubrió su preciosa voluntad. Le dijo, sabe y ten seguro en tu corazón, hijo mío, el más desamparado, que yo soy la siempre Virgen Santa María, Madre de el Dios de gran verdad, de aquel por quien vivimos, del Creador de las personas, del dueño de lo que está cerca y junto, el Señor del cielo y de la tierra. And just pay attention to the words of welcoming of the Blessed Mother. Quiero mucho y deseo vivamente que en este lugar me levante mi ermita. En ella mostraré y daré a las gentes todo mi amor, mi compasión, mi ayuda y mi defensa. Porque yo soy la madre misericordiosa de ti y de todas las naciones que viven en esta tierra. Que me amen, que me hablen, que me busquen y en mí confíen. Allí he de oír sus lamentos y remediar y curar todas sus miserias, penas y dolores. The attitude of the Blessed Mother, Our Lady of Guadalupe, in the relationship with San Juan Diego, can teach us a lot about this service that we want to, to do, to excel in, of protecting uh, our, our immigrant community and our refugees. As Catholics, we cannot recoil from the fear being peddled by some in the political world. Everyone has God-given dignity, which must be honored as the Blessed Mother honor San Juan Diego.
and in him every child of God. Every person is created in the image and likeness of God and the Lord calls upon us to stand by our brothers and sisters and to act on their behalf, to welcome the stranger and do unto others as we would want them to do to us. Let us apply the gospel message faithfully and boldly to the human problem of immigration. Thank you. so blessed in this archdiocese to have a shepherd who truly smells like the sheep. <laughs> that's not, that's not. <laughs> and now it gives me great uh, joy to introduce our respondents because they are truly <laughs> two of my heroes. I, like so many, have been so inspired to see them in action in their ministries along the Rio Grande Valley and the Arizona border. When the daily news blares out about caravans and tear gas and asylum seekers turned away, I so often feel overwhelmed and honestly close to despair. Or worse, cynicism that anything can change. But when I remember our sister Norma and Father Sean and recall their simple yet powerful ministries of welcoming Jesus in our migrant sisters and brothers with so much love, my hope is strengthened and I am challenged to continue the journey and to do what I can do, however simple and small that may be. So I'd like to introduce both of our respondents, beginning with Father Sean, but we will begin with Sister Norma as a respondent. So Father Sean is a Jesuit priest, born on the East Coast, but raised on the West. In 2006, while serving as pastor of Dolores Mission in Los Angeles, a true beacon of hope for so many migrants there, he participated in, a, in an exploratory phase of a new migrant ministry to be established in southern Arizona and northern Mexico. These efforts led to the inauguration, the founding of the Kino Border Initiative, a Catholic binational collaboration effort that focuses on humanitarian assistance, education, research, and advocacy in the area of migration. Sean has been the executive director there since 2009. Sister Norma Pimentel is a member of the missionary, Missionaries of Jesus. As executive director of Catholic Charities of the Rio Grande Valley, and for over 12 years, she has been a catalyst for an amazing collaborative ministry in the Diocese of Brownsville that involves both Catholics, non-Catholics, and people without any kind of proclaimed faith and even the Border Patrol. <laughs> Her prophetic leadership is a shining light that has comforted the afflicted and has afflicted the comfortable. Nationally recognized as a champion of immigrants, she has received many honors. Most recently, she received Notre Dame's 2018 Le Terre Medal. But today, this month, she has been named by Texas Monthly as one of the most powerful Texans <laughs> along with Olympic winners and politicians. <laughs> and so it is my, <laughs> my great joy to invite Sister Norma, followed by Father Shep. Thank you, Arturo. Wow. <clears throat> what can I say? It's, it's a... <laughs> He is the one that marks the path and tells us what to do and who to be. Thank you so much, uh, Archbishop. Your words uh, are very good. I mean, what else can we say? You said what we need to do. I think that what we are um, 
but hearing you and, and uh, outlining all those uh, things that that are important for us to, as a country, as a people, to respond to, um, it's uncomprehensible to me that we could be say, sitting here in the United States and say this is happening, you know, and that we have to speak in defense of human life, you know, and yet we do. Because I think in fixing the immigration system, what we're really doing is humanizing the immigration uh, system. We need to humanize it. We have to realize that it is all our responsibility to humanize and bring our, you know, I remember one time I was speaking in, at USCCB in Washington, and after I spoke, this girl said, sister just made it very clear that what we need to do is reclaim our humanity, you know? Because sometimes we lose sight of that. We get so involved with our own lives and with our own loss and our own things that are important to us that we lose sight of our humanity. We disconnect ourselves to who we really are and then we start making decisions that keeps us so strange from the reality of the person that we have before us and we're talking about people, children. All you have to do is come to the border and see and experience and encounter. And I'm certain, I have no doubt that God has made us in a way that makes us respond automatically in a very humane way to the to the children and the parents and the mothers and what we see, the human suffering before us. It's Jesus himself right there asking us to reach out and care for them. I started back in 2014 when we were um, seeing all these children and I asked to go into that detention facility for children and that story, I bring it up because it marked me, it pierced me profoundly to see the children in a detention facility. And we're talking about children five years old. In one of our prisons here in the United States, in conditions that were inhumane, crying, pleading, please, por favor, sacame de aquí. That he's, they're asking all of us here in this United States, people, this is not okay. We cannot allow for a country to be governed by laws that hurt human life, especially a, a child. We have to defend life, all life. We don't have to justify what we do because it is the right thing to do. This is who we are. This is who God created us to be. It's uncomprehensible that someone who believes in Jesus Christ cannot be moved to help that child and to allow themselves to keep themselves from because there's loss. There is no law above God's law. All laws help us to live better as human people, to protect each other, help each other, guide each other, to be the people, the community, the world that we need to be. All we need to do is connect with our God. And if we don't do that, I think maybe that's why we don't feel anything about who we're talking about. I have the privilege to witness daily a man kneeling down before the Our Lady of Guadalupe in our chapel after having gone through such a terrible journey, encountering so many difficulties, telling me that the journey was fue bien duro. It was very hard. 
for a man, grown man, to say that and cry before you, it's not an easy journey. And finally, to encounter a place where you're welcome, where the first word that they hear is, como estas? And they break into tears to tell you and share their story. And when they see our image of Our Lady, they'll kneel down and pray with tears in their faces of thanksgiving. Gracias, Señor. ¿Por qué estoy aquí? ¿Por qué me estás cuidando? If anything they have and they show us is their magnificent faith. They've been stripped of everything. They lost even their shoelaces in their shoes. but they have their faith. I ask many times, why? ¿Por qué te viniste? Don't you know how difficult it is? All that you're going through, you're pregnant, you're, you have a child with you, and the answer is always the same. ¿Por qué no me pude quedar? Si me quedo, me matan, o matan a mi niño. I had to come, I had no choice. I had to risk it and hope that maybe where I'm going, I will find somebody who will welcome me, protect me. That's who we are as Catholics, as Christians, as people of goodwill. Being able to respond to that person before us who needs us, who's asking, please, por favor, ayúdame. Who can say no to that? We all will. I remember once I was uh, interviewed by a radio station back in the valley, and this person, uh, it was a talk show, and they were asking questions. And this man calls and she said, he says, Sister, I'm not going to be Catholic anymore because you are, because of what you're doing. They said, well, I don't know what you're going to be because every single other religion is here as well with me, you know? <laughs> We're all together. It's amazing and beautiful to be on the ground, to be at the border. It's a privilege to witness and be part of a human response to a human reality. I will invite you to be part of that. Thank you. Well, it's a great honor to be here. And as Arturo mentioned, it's my second time here at, at Monk. And uh, what an honor to be with, with uh, Archbishop Garcia Sira. Here and with uh, and Sister Norma uh, in this wonderful event and really reflecting on this very important and critical issue for us. Um, the, the Archbishop has presented powerfully uh, a Catholic immigration plan for the United States. And he's really talked about, well, these, these root causes, which are uh, points that we really try to emphasize at the Kino Border Initiative on the border. There's really a lack of awareness of these root causes, and I don't think we can talk about them enough. And so I'm very grateful to the Archbishop for, for really uh, mentioning and uh, emphasizing these root causes of why people migrate. Economic need, family separation, generalized violence, uh, and really promoting policies such as a path to citizenship for undocumented persons, visa reform, and the protection of human rights. It's also highlighted the toxic political climate, which has made migrants vulnerable to racism and xenophobia, and all in violation of their God-given human dignity. A recent study that we had a privilege to be a part of really confirms what's at stake here, and really confirms the harm being done to immigrant families. This report, was published in collaboration with the Center for Migration Studies in New York, along with the Jesuit Conference of Canada and the US. It's called Communities 
in crisis, interior removals, and their human consequences. And the study highlights the harm done to migrant individuals and families, and really due to our current immigration system, particularly in the areas of detention and deportation. During this research, we met people like Christina, the mother of five children living here in the United States, children from the ages of 16 to eight, whose husband was awaiting deportation after arrest at an immigration checkpoint. She talks about how her children feel like her husband abandoned them. This is something that I hear regularly on the border as well as our shelter for women and children. Moms sitting there in Nogales, Sonora, and one of the most painful things for them is that inability to be with their children and their children asking them, Mom, why aren't you here? Why aren't you with me? Or even not <coughs> believing that she can't be with them like she's intentionally abandoned them. But this is the experience that she talks about, how her children feel, feel like their father abandoned them, and then how she struggles to clean houses, earning 25 to $30 a day, and trying to support her family with such a low wage. Her story really supports the findings reflected in the data that we gathered. 74% reporting that their families did not have enough financial resources to support their children, while 63% of the families did not even have enough to live on. Along with the points that the Archbishop has made, I'd like to highlight three additional points that I think are really pertinent to his remarks regarding a Catholic immigration plan. One is this whole question of how to integrate immigrants into U.S. society. Really for decades, and I'm sure, and, and this is something I've studied I mean, in our theological centers at Mock and, and, and at places all over the United States, how the Catholic Church has served as a powerful instrument for immigrant integration by providing a sense of community, providing a sense of family, providing an education to many young immigrants empowering them to grow up as successful citizens in this country, really in every sense of the word. Don Kerwin, the director of the Center for Migration Studies in New York, has highlighted important principles for integrating immigrants more fully into US society, such as respect for principles like freedom and equality, the ability to work, and provide for one's family, and so contribute to the U.S. economy, and to cherish the values that migrants bring, not only their work ethic, but also their deep religiosity and their love of family. A traditional definition of integration emphasizes how it works both ways, that the immigrant has rights, but has also responsibilities in becoming a full member of society. In an anti-immigrant context, which the Archbishop highlighted so well, our nation faces the key question of how to integrate immigrants more fully into our society in a mutually enriching way and in a way that respects their human dignity. The church can play a powerful role in this process through its pastoral, educational, and social service programs so that immigrants may integrate fully while their original culture is respected and valued. Sister Norma's work is just a great example of that. I mean, migrants are released. She talked about the man who came after that journey. Just those words of welcome. It's like the first portal. It's like the first door, you know, the entrance into the U.S. And even though they face uncertainty with their cases uh, pending in immigration court, that spirit of welcome and that spirit that is given through the services that, that she and her staff offer really uh, help begin to integrate our sisters and brothers into our family, into our society here in the US. At the same time, while economic need, family separation, and deep-seated violence are root causes of migration, increasingly climate change 
and environmental instability are driving people around the world, and particularly in Central America, to leave their homes in order to survive. A recent report by, of all sources, the Weather Channel, <laughs> indicates that the dry corridor of Central America, which encompasses El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, has one million subsistence farmers and 1.6 million people who are food insecure. It is a region plagued by inconsistent rain, droughts, and low crop yields, which has caused more subsistent farmers to leave their land and to migrate north. An article last week in the Texas Observer explains how the children who arrived at the US-Mexico border in 2014 migrated in the midst of a drought afflicting the Northern Triangle, afflicting the dry corridor. In his encyclical Laudato Si, Pope Francis highlights the lack of recognition of environmental refugees as refugees and their lack of legal protections, while he advocates for the full development of renewable sources of energy, which would not only have a positive impact on the environment, but also on the lives of many poor people who rely on the land for their very survival. By countering the harmful effects of climate change, people may be able to have a dignified way of life on the land, which would address an increasingly powerful push factor for migration. Finally, while US immigration reform, just and humane reform is sorely needed, it must be complemented with a coordinated effort both regionally and in a broader international context to address the various issues related to immigration. The United Nations has been engaged in a multi-year process to pass a global compact on migration, to facilitate collaboration among nations on making possible a safe, orderly, and regular migration. As we speak, representatives of the nations involved in passing the Global Compact are meeting in Morocco, and, and hopefully we'll will pass that compact so that uh, it becomes a, an agreement that countries can, can follow in terms of trying to coordinate their efforts to respond to this reality in a just and humane way. With broad principles on issues such as push factors for migration, respect for human rights, and a response to the phenomenon of undocumented migration, the compact hopes to make it possible for nations in particular areas of the world to agree on and implement solutions that respond to the specific needs of their respective regions. In this scenario, the United States, Mexico, and the countries of Central America's Northern Triangle could collaborate on reforms that address issues such as economic development and gang violence. The church in the end can serve as a powerful and transformative leaven to promote just and humane immigration reform in the US with an emphasis on respect for human dignity as the center of any immigration reform proposal. As Pope Francis powerfully said during his homily in Ciudad Juarez almost three years ago, this human tragedy that represents forced migration today is a global phenomenon. This crisis, which can be measured with statistics, we want to measure with names, stories, families. If we take his words to heart and focus on the names, the stories, and the families, then this will impact the immigration policies we pass, and the ways we treat our sister and brother migrants, both individually and as a nation. A lot is at stake for us. For as Cardinal Luis Antonio Tagle, the Archbishop of Manila and the President of Caritas Internacionalis said in his recent <coughs> Advent message, it is how we live out our journeys is how we live out our journeys and how we treat the people we meet 
that has the potential to transform our world. Thank you. I can only say that it's uh, extraordinarily humbling for me to be in, uh, in your company and to hear these three great prophetic voices. Thank you. My modest role here this morning is uh, simply to serve as a surrogate for our, for the readers of America um, and for those who are watching at home um, and uh, uh, to, um, uh, to, to act as host for our conversation and we will provide an opportunity after we've had some moderated conversation at the beginning uh, to take some questions or comments from you. Uh, I, I was struck uh, when you were speaking, Archbishop, uh, by how many of the elements of reform that you were talking about were a part of the reform that we uh, brought about in this country in the 1980s, uh, which was a bipartisan reform. It was uh, Democrats and Republicans coming together, Speaker O'Neill and President Reagan, and um, uh, voices like Father Hesper from Notre Dame. Um, that seems almost unimaginable today, given the polarization that we have in this country. It, so in, in, in order to change the policy, it seems like we have to, on some level, first change hearts. And I, I wanted to ask the first two Archbishops, but actually all three of you, how do, how do we do that? How do we go about changing hearts? Now, I don't mean the folks who are actively xenophobic or hateful, but Probably the majority of people who are ignorant or confused or not thinking about the issue or scared. Um, have you encountered people who had a different view on this issue and then through your encounter with them, they have changed their minds? And if so, or their hearts, how does that happen? Well, you know, I watched a little bit of the uh, funeral uh, President Bush, and seeing what happened there, it was such a contrast of what we experienced daily in the last few years. And many of the people there uh, expressed how decency, kindness, encounters, But it's, 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 it's a conversion. It's a call to conversion. And as you mentioned, it's at the level of the heart. It, it, and sometimes it's not the ideas. You know, I mean, could be play, the ideas could be placed clearly in documents or in a phrase or in a paragraph that ignites the mind. But it's uh, a kind of lack that needs to take place also at the level of the heart. And sister. Norma was saying, and that was my experience yesterday, you know, there were 140 children in all ages, and baby, mothers with babies, and, and some of them, they were not there because they were born in the last month. Um, and, 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 you know, we have been gifted by God, as in the plan of God, we were created. This image and likeness. And so it's not that difficult, but it has become so difficult for the voices that we hear constantly and the attitudes. And, and as uh, um, Dr. Arturo was saying, sometimes it's almost you are at the point of to experience this, to be uh, um, desperation, you know, I mean, to feel like uh, so much and so humane that uh, it can paralyze us. And so how we need to continue connecting with the heart, with the real people, 
to not let that paralyzation take place in us as we continue and it's one at a time or group at a time you know um, and as I mentioned all over there, Guadalupe is I have been learning a lot about how to relate to immigrants uh, through that encounter. And other people can pick it up. Uh, if we are consistent and we are boldly, but also if we relate with decency, with kindness, maybe something else will happen. And we, we have hope that it will. I, I agree also, uh, Archbishop, about this uh, perilous, uh, there's a fear, a force, that is pushing in our environment, in our society, that brings out this fear that paralyzes us. And it makes us uh, so distant from reality and not experience human life for what it is, you know? And so uh, when we break away from that, like as if it was a bubble that we pop it, you know? We're able to then allow ourselves to experience, to encounter, to be present, you know? I had a, I would like to share, I shared this before, but it's a, it's an experience that I had of somebody who came to, back in the 80s, we had Casa Romero for several, many years, and um, Juliana Garcia and myself oversaw that shelter in the 80s for Nicaragua and Central America, because we had similar what was happening then. And I had to buy a, a, a Xerox machine, and, and uh, because we were filing uh, asylum papers there, thousands of them. Every single person that I could reach just filled them out, and believe me, a lot of people got their asylum after we helped them, so many of them. But I needed a Xerox, ma Xerox machine, and this lady comes over, and she actually tells me up front, I'm gonna sell you my Xerox machine because I'm a businesswoman, <laughs> but I don't believe in what you're doing, Sister Nora. I'm 100% I guess you helping these illegal aliens, you know? And I said, thank you for letting me know. You know let me show you what I do and why. And I took her around, and I introduced her to the families, to the children, and explained to her them why they were there. When she saw, she had the encounter with them. She comes back and tells me, sister, I'm 100% in favor of what you're doing. 100%. That evening, her husband calls and tells me, sister, um, I don't know what you did to my wife, but she came home tonight and she told me, if she sister ever calls you, you make sure you do whatever she tells you. you know? That's how we change. When we allow others to see, to experience, to have that encounter. Because it's not up to us. It, God has a marvelous way of reaching out to the heart of each and every one of us and make us change our heart if we, we're not in the right place. So really, my answer would be along the lines of what Sister Norma is saying. I, I'm recalling a, a visit we had from a student immersion group. We host a lot of groups of people, especially students who are interested in this experience of direct service dialogue and reflection on the border and frequently students when they return to their hometowns and to their schools they'll write a letter of evaluation to the Jesuit who who works in these uh, on these immersion experiences and so I had the opportunity to read one of these letters and, uh, and this student uh, wrote dear father um, I didn't want to come to the border you know and uh, because I thought you all were going to impose your, your views on me. But then he goes on and he really talks about the experience that he had. He said, you know, I, 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 I went to your Comador, I went to your center in Nagawa, Sonora, I met with migrants there, I walked in the desert, I saw backpacks lying there. I realized that the people I met in the Comador, that these belonged to them or people like them. Uh, I saw them convicted in court in Operation Streamline, convicted of a criminal offense for what is a, what is a civil offense. And, and so he really talks about his transformation. I went home different. 
And I went home wanting to make a difference. I went home wanting to volunteer in some way. And, and so really what happened, I think, is what, what Sister has described, that experience of encounter. When groups come, we tell them we're going to humanize the issue, and we're going to complicate it for you. <laughs> and that's really what, what happens, uh, because they have that direct contact, their hearts are open, and they realize, both at a head and a heart level, just the, the complexity of, of this issue. Pope Francis with uh, Caritas and this whole campaign of sharing the journey, if you go to their website, one of the things that you see are these photos of immigrants. And if you click on a photo, it will tell you their story. And so really it's another way of, of trying to facilitate that direct encounter. And so I think what's incumbent upon us as a church and really as a society is really trying to find creative ways to facilitate that encounter. Not everyone can come to the border. But there are immigrants all over the U.S. and, and the churches everywhere, and, and there are various ways that we can facilitate that encounter. And I think that that's the way, slowly but surely, we're going to transform minds and hearts, and it's a way that we'll see the, the reform that we seek. It's, uh, introducing humanity and complexity to the conversation. These are, of course, are things that don't necessarily fit very well into sound bites <laughs> or into uh, tweets. Um, so, for our our folks who uh, might be watching this on the on the live stream, uh, amid all of the of the camp that's out there and all of the uh, the fake news, what is the biggest piece of fake news? Do you think what is the what is the biggest misperception that you think must be dispelled about this issue? Whoever. Well, I think it's the dehumanization of migrants. You know that that like migrants when they when they come to us, one of the things I'm sure Sister Norma hears this a lot too is just that you know I, I'm not a criminal. You know I'm not I'm not a bad person. You know and 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 um, and I think that's one of the, the the key points in fake news is just this this broad um, swath. I mean, we're considering that that migrants just as a whole as are. are uh, are a threat, you know, are, are a danger. Um, I think that's one of the biggest, um, uh, biggest myths and biggest lies, frankly. And, and so I think it's beholden on us, you know, and I think it's through this experience of encounter, it's uh, finding creative ways to, to hold up the truth front and center, you know, which is that they are men, women, and children, they have dignity, they have hopes, they have dreams, they have desires just like any human being and uh, obviously we need order we need a process and we need security and considering all that we need to respect human dignity and to raise up the the, the truth which is that that we're all made in God's image and likeness and um, and, uh, and that migrants are, are, are um, have dignity and uh, and contribute a lot, you know, both to the church and, and, and to our nation. Uh, I believe that that dehumanization also takes place in a country of law. Uh, just saying something that you will click in the public. They are breaking the law. They break the law. There is no reflection, there is no study of the situation. Just, they are bad people, and they are criminals. They are the worst, because they are breaking the law. <laughs> and now, with that situation, all the, uh, the, the seeker, as, asylum seekers, they need to talk to someone about their situation. But if automatically, because they step in the country, and, and they broke the law, and, and, and that sounds very understandable for many people. They said, that's it. You see? They, 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 they are not, um, they're not coming with good intentions, and then people build up stories. One, uh, one uh, way to encounter people uh, in order to help in this kind of conversion could be immigrants who are already citizens and sometimes I have been 
in, in dialogues in which we do not realize in the way we talk that we are immigrants in the United States and that we are okay and everybody's okay with one another there. Maybe to recoup how to be an immigrant is not a bad thing. And that not necessarily uh, the, the law is broken by those who are trying to search for their life. And it's the opposite. Yesterday, it was a young man who was saying, it was like 17. And I asked them, you know, how long are you going to be here? And they said, well, we were told that six months or a year. And then he said, but I am going. I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow. I'm going to see my family in New York tomorrow. I mean, it's today. And I said, and, and what, what, are you, what, what is in your mind? Sure, with all your peers here. He said, I want to do the best. It's hard to believe that someone is trying to come here to cause harm. And those we have also laws to detect or ways to detect that somebody should not be here because he's trying to harm, to cause harm. They are coming to do good. They want to win their best. I think the, the biggest fake news is the border is not safe. I am from the border. I lived there for my life. It is safe. It is not. I think that they're pushing so much to this militarization of the border, uh, putting up walls, putting up front, uh, like we're being invaded by children, families? <laughs> you bring the military to what, for a child? It doesn't make sense, you know? It is totally fake news. If you're from the border, you know it is safe there, you know? Yes, we need to, our border patrol really does their job. They actually are. They're not releasing criminals when they have this cash and release and then the president says <laughs> they're releasing criminals. How, how, how not true is that? There's no way that our law enforcement is not going to do their job. And they do their job very well. They're there to protect us and to keep our borders safe. And that's what they do. You know? It is not true that our local uh, city officials, a uh, city like the sheriffs and the police, are protecting criminals and letting and letting uh, letting immigrants go because they're criminals. They're doing their job. They're protecting our cities. They're actually crashing all criminals, you know, whether they're immigrants or not. That's their job. And for them to be put down because they're doing their job, I don't understand that. That's totally fake news. I, I was thinking, uh, Archbishop, when you were speaking about. I, I was recently having a conversation with a member of my family about this, and I was talking about my grandfather, who uh, crossed an ocean when he was 10 years old, alone, uh, to live with an aunt he had never met in Massachusetts because his parents had died. And uh, he came around 1909, around the time of the founding of American Magazine. And uh, this person then responded to me, oh, but he came here legally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, and, and, and you're right, that, that does kind of stop the conversation, but uh, I said, well, but he, there wasn't really a law. I mean, <laughs> it's like congratulating him for not speeding on a street where there's no speed limit. <laughs> um, but even if he didn't have a legal claim, he had a moral one. His parents were dead. This was his family. This was his only hope for survival. And I think you're right. We lose sight of that, of the, the human desire uh, for uh, life that is at the, at the, at the heart of, of this movement. Um, but now, presuming that over the next couple of years there isn't a change and we continue to have a, a national government that either does harm or does nothing. Um, if, and it, if the national government is unable to deal with this issue or actually makes things worse, what, what can we do at a practical level right now uh, without waiting for the national government to act? What can we do as uh, 
citizens, as people who care about these issues, uh, as, as, as uh, Catholic Christians right now to help. I will not discard that we need to continue, even if things are not changing, a level of policy laws, to continue insisting. Um, knowing that uh, even now, many groups and people of goodwill are doing little things here and there, well, a lot of things, but, um, but to continue pressing that a reform is needed. I think there is more um, in Congress. Yeah, people don't understand that something needs to be done. It's just that uh, the, the context today is not favorable. But there are people who can think that we need to resolve this. I mean, the fact that it was it's at, it's at the heart of the campaign at the present time, or, that is saying that this is important because, they, of course, as we said, it lives. But we need to continue as leaders, though as you as you added, with uh, conscience and moral conscience, to do all what we can um, to welcome them. And you know, I remember when I was when I came here to San Antonio. Well, when I came to the United States, I was welcomed, welcomed not only once. We need to welcome, welcome, and welcome people, and especially wonderful people. I have been here eight years, and when I meet people, they said, welcome. Welcome to San Antonio. You are becoming one with San Antonio. We need to be affirmed, and especially those who are more, 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 most vulnerable. It's very difficult. Yesterday, there were many tables as they were eating, and there were some of those tables that, as I said earlier, they didn't want to express anything. Their feelings has been shut down, their dreams. Don't say anything, don't talk to nobody. You know, that even we know that they, they need to say something, but they can't. That is tremendous damage that will cost, forget about a few years of therapy, you know. It will take tremendous effort and a, and a full life maybe to restore just that sense of dignity of the individual more than for us, for him or for her, to recoup his or her dignity. You know? But we need to continue saying, God loves you, I love you. you know, uh, anything that I can do for you, I will do it. We will find ways how we can help you. you know? but. Well, I would like to say the four things that our Holy Father has named for us to do as the four milestones, milepost for action. <coughs> and they're very clear. They're going line to everything that we've been saying. But he points them up clearly. One is welcome. We must be able to bring down our fears and be open ourselves out to reach out to those that need us. Protect. Protect them. Make sure that they're safe, you know. From the start, from the moment they have to leave their country, hoping that maybe they don't have to leave their country, but they can actually have the right to stay in their own home country and migrate only if they really need want to, not because they need to, you know. But provide that safety net, you know, that place that we can be able to know that they can be safe. Protect the children, protect the families. And the other is promote them. Bring out the best, the goodness that there is in us and in them as well. I think that that's very important. And finally, integrate. Integrate, which is the opportunity to make sure they're part of us and make sure that they can be part of our society, our community, and who we are. So when we have immersion groups come visit us, uh, this is a question that frequently comes up. What, what can I do? Because when they're 
when their hearts have been opened and they have this deeper awareness of this reality, they naturally feel overwhelmed and almost even incapable of, feeling, of coming up with a sense of how to respond. And so what we do is we, we, we give them three steps. So one is to tell the story. So how do you tell the story of the people that you've met here? Whether it's around your dinner table, which is sometimes the most threatening place to tell that story. And yet a very important place, right? Because it starts there. Uh, how do you tell a story in your residence hall? How do you tell a story in the class that you're taking? How do you tell a story after or during, uh, during liturgy at your high school, at your university, or your parish? Um, and, and if you haven't had that direct encounter, to seek it out. I think, I think that's, that's a key step, and that's something that we can, we can all do. The second thing we tell them is, is to think about the possibility of volunteering. You know, how can you volunteer in the place that you live? Uh, what are those opportunities? Uh, visit those places. Uh, discern in light of you know, your, your time uh, commitments what, what is possible and where you're moved, you know, where your heart's moved to, to serve. And then to advocate. And we've had, had, had students who uh, have done wonderful work advocating, whether it's responding to email blasts to urge their congressional representatives to vote for, in favor or against certain pieces of legislation, or actually meeting personally with them. Uh, last, last year, we, uh, at the Kino Board Initiative, collaborated with the Jesuit Parish in Phoenix, uh, St. Francis Xavier and Brophy College Preparatory, our high school there, really focusing on, on DACA, on this, uh, because at that time we were trying to really work for a legislative solution to DACA. And so there were days of prayer, there were um, phone calls made urging our congressional representatives to, to, to take this issue seriously, to vote in favor of DACA. Uh, this, this was something that, it was small, but, but, but very doable. But we believe that just with these simple steps, and the more we do that in a collaborative way and in, and in network and as a church, then I think we will see the fruit of those efforts. I consider that there is one uh, real obstacle, <coughs> a temptation. Well, no temptation is for us to fall into temptation regarding to promote our brothers and sisters, migrants and refugees. And that is that in the climate that we are today is to keep quiet, to play safe. So there are homes, environments, meetings in which it's almost prohibited to say the word migrant, immigrant, refugee. How to be agents, to know how to do it with kindness, with prudence, and with the truth. But to, 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 have, to have that there, you know, um, and then would be encounter, dialogue, and prayer. Because if we're talking about the, the conversion that we need, or people need, it has to be prayer at the heart, at the heart of the whole thing, the whole discussion. Because even us who are involved in all this, we need to change. And prayer, you know, prayer is, 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 a, is a vehicle to recognize what is happening, which are my feelings, uh, what is the mission, what is the vision, what the gospel values, etc. But at the level, uh, at that level, otherwise, um, we need social workers. But this movement of liberation will will need more than that. It needs grace. Yeah. It, and it seems to me that the. Uh, that it's that fear that gets in the way of us having those conversations, isn't it? Like that wasn't a particularly pleasant conversation that I had, or um, in, and uh, people seem to now be in the business of avoiding anything that has to do with politics and their conversations with people, but it's important to bear witness to it. So I, I guess one question that I would have, and then we'll open it up for folks here, is what is the, 
I mean, the USCCB is led on this, has been a very strong voice. Uh, there have been many bishops like yourself who have been a very strong voice on this issue, and then um, folks like Sister and Father. But what is the role of the pulpit in this? You know, in the, in the context of prayer, in the context of liturgy, uh, you know, a lot of folks say, I don't want to hear about these things from the pulpit, right? But there's a, it's an important to talk about there, isn't it? Yes, oh, uh, that goes along with it. Uh, we have to proclaim and not to fall in temptation of being quiet or to let ourselves be robed or to, to, be, to be part of the, of the crime because the bottom line is that people are suffering. So we have to say it. Now we have to, to, to think about it and maybe in collaboration to come up with, uh, with points. You know, you, this, this setting is more academic and is more people who are already involved in ministry doing something for immigrants. The homeless are very short, have to be very well crafted. But to stop saying it, we are participating in the crime. <laughs> She's the most powerful. <laughs> you know, I just want to say one thing. I want to remember our late Bishop John Fitzpatrick. Amen. Those who know him know that he was a bishop ahead of his times. And he spoke in defense of the immigrants, even though he lost more than 50% of the support in his diocese. And he stayed fast ahead. So, not be afraid to speak. <laughs> so I'll just say two things. So, so one is, I think from the pulpit, it's, it's helpful, and this is what I try to do, is to talk about the migrants that we serve as part of the, the message of the homily. Why? Because, uh, again, it, it highlights their, their human experience, their humanity. It helps them, at least hopefully in that way, come into contact with the people in the congregation and, and that their story really inform how people grapple with the gospel. The other thing, just real briefly, I'll say is that when I was uh, had just started at KBI, uh, I was at a local parish in southern Arizona preaching on the gospel of the Good Samaritan from Luke. And I talked about how the person in the ditch among them was the undocumented migrant. And this woman in the back of the church stood up and started to to yell at me. Um, <laughs> and there was this audible gasp in the church. And, and so she and I start to dialogue. <laughs> Dialogical homily, not the one I had imagined. <laughs> but, uh, but something extraordinary happened uh, because she was saying, well, they're, they're illegals, they're breaking the law. Uh, but after that, uh, because people were so struck by and maybe even traumatized by what had happened, uh, there were all these kind of conversations around the church talking about well, what had happened and really grappling with this message. In fact, and in fact, one woman came up to me afterwards and said, Father, thank you for reminding us of who we are. And, and, so, and so even that resistance, it's not always a bad thing <laughs> because it can open up ourselves to, to uh, well, grappling with this reality and I think come to deeper truths. Uh, and so we obviously have to pick our moments and the ways that we do that. But I think when we do speak the truth in that way, uh, though it, it can be hard and challenging, it can open us to deeper reflection and hopefully engaged action on this important issue. Would you join me in thanking Father Malone? <laughs> Conversation, conversation takes time and space. Unfortunately, at this moment, we're out of time. Someone got the time. But we, we, hope, we hope, though, that uh, you st join us for liturgy, which we will be going to next, and to lunch. We have a wonderful lunch planned for you, where we can have good food and good conversation. 
Um, during this time of year, our people all over, our Mexican, Mexican American, and many, many others, indigenous, and celebrate uh, Santa Maria del Camino, Our Lady of Guadalupe. And so one of the things Archbishop uh, invited us to is to put our prayer into action. One symbol of that that has been so much a part of our Latino expression of faith is a procession. And so we are going to invite you as a symbol of our ongoing efforts uh, to put our faith into action that you would follow, there's gonna be two uh, people bearing this beautiful image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. As we process across the street to the seminary chapel, Our Lady's Chapel, and leading us, you gotta have mariachis, right? <laughs> so they're gonna get us started, and then we'll follow them out there, okay? Yeah. Just before we go, I just want to recognize somebody present here who is actually my spiritual director and great friend, and that is who this call is named after, Father Juan Alfaro, who is my friend. Thank you for being with us.